the map that we had talked about some time ago. Deputy Chief Health Officer Deb Friedman is here as well. COVID Commander Jerome Weimar is here. Uh, first of all, uh, there are 779 cases recorded yesterday, all locally acquired. That brings us to a total of 8,011 cases across the community. I'm sad to have to inform you that there are two people who have passed away, a man in his 80s from Moreland and a man in his 70s from Hume. We, of course, extend our best wishes and our deepest condolences to their family and friends. This will be a very difficult time for them. 82% uh, of yesterday's cases were under the age of 50. There are 325 people that are currently in hospital. 73 of those are in ICU and 54 are on a ventilator. Uh, four people in their 20s are currently in intensive care. All of them are on a ventilator. Eight people in their 30s are in ICU and three of them are on a machine to breathe. So that makes the point very clearly that this is now by and large a pandemic of the unvaccinated and otherwise healthy people who are young, uh, don't have a long list of underlying conditions, if not vaccinated, are finding themselves in hospital. That's not a point of criticism. It's just, I think, a point to motivate everyone to come forward and get vaccinated as quickly as possible. To that end, there were 34,280 vaccines administered in our state hubs yesterday. And of course, GPs will have done their share. Community pharmacy will have done some yesterday as well. But uh, the numbers we have the greatest visibility over, of course, are the, one, the hubs that we're running. Uh, so just over 34,000 vaccines administered yesterday. That's uh, a very significant effort. And we thank all of the staff involved in that. And of course, we thank those more than 34,000 Victorians who came forward and honoured the appointment they'd made uh, and played their part in protecting not just themselves, but indeed protecting all of us and allowing us to open up and be free. We have reached a 77.7 per cent of the 16 and over age group uh, for a first dose and 47.3 per cent have received two doses. Uh, we are steadily making progress. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether we have enough supply. Uh, there's been some positive announcements and some, I think, three weeks of October is now uh, confirmed and we've got greater certainty over that. So that's good for all of us. Uh, but I can also confirm that, uh, again, I, I'm not here to talk about appointments that are available in GPs and pharmacies, but I would say uh, there is significant supply uh, that is not necessarily forward booked in pharmacy. That's both Moderna and AstraZeneca. Uh, and in GP clinics, uh, there are, we're led to believe, significant reserves there, that there are spots that people can fill. Uh, that'll be both AstraZeneca and Pfizer. For our part, there are 3,495 Pfizer appointments over the next week that do not have someone's name beside them. So if you go online, you can make a booking, you can have one of those appointments, and you can, as I said, play your part to, in protecting yourself, but also play your part in getting us open and seeing less people across the community gravely ill and in hospital. Similarly, there are 6,984, so close to 7,000 AstraZeneca appointments available in state hubs that don't have someone's name beside them. So for all those reasons and more, please go online, please book one of those appointments, please play your part. Now in terms of restrictions, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to announce that on it's estimated on Tuesday we'll reach that 80% single dose number. That's a very important threshold. Uh, and of course, I think our single dose numbers will go beyond the 80% mark, which is very good. That means we can be very confident about reaching 80% double dose uh, on the timelines that we've outlined. That, I thank everybody, everybody who uh, by Tuesday will, will be part of that 80%. That's a fantastic achievement. And as we announced some time ago, that makes some things possible. We're not overselling this. They are modest things. They're not, it's not Freedom Day. Uh, it's not the end of the lockdown. Uh, that, that is getting closer every day though. Uh, but it is important to acknowledge that the Chief Health Officer has uh, decided and has confirmed that from 11.59pm on Tuesday the 28th of September, so in just a couple of days' time, there will be those modest easings that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in regional Victoria, the outdoor venue cap will increase from 20 to 30. Uh, there are some changes in hair and beauty and personal care. In metropolitan Melbourne, 
and in those regional areas that are locked down. And uh, Associate Professor Friedman will speak to uh, those issues in just a moment, regional lockdowns. Uh, residents will be able to undertake recreation at outdoor facilities, boating, tennis, golf, those things that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that'll be, there'll be rules, there'll be some formality to that, and I think clubs and associations, we're working very closely with them, and there'll be advice to people who are engaging in those sort of activities, uh, whether it be through a club or simply on the website. Uh, but that, that activity will be able to occur uh, it's been prohibited. It'll now be able to be able to occur from 11:59 p.m. on Tuesday night. So essentially Wednesday morning, those activities will be back. But it may look a bit different. It may not be the same experience pre pre COVID. Uh, there'll be some rules, but I think people will be delighted to be able to get back to those things that they're very very passionate about, and that as the chief health officer has determined, they're outside with some structure. Uh, they can be relatively low risk. Importantly, to access those sorts of activities and in recognition of the fact that we are on a journey to open up, not to remain closed, uh, you'll also recall, and I can confirm today, that from that, from that time, so 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday, the 10 kilometres moves to 15 kilometres. Uh, so exercise, shopping, and indeed those activities I've just talked about, you can now go 15 kilometres from home. We'd already confirmed uh, the move to four hours. There's no change to that. There are some further changes to personal training. So five people and a vaccinate who are all fully vaccinated and a fully vaccinated trainer. Uh, and there's also some further changes to some of the rules that remained uh, in relation to playgrounds. Uh, they're lifted as well from 11.59 on Tuesday night. What that means is that all of those things we said we'd be able to do once we hit 80%, we are doing. And uh, that I know will be welcome news. I'm not overselling it to the point where it's more than it is, it's significant, uh, but we've still got a way to go and we've got to get to 70% double dose and then 80% double dose in order to firstly lift the lockdown and then have pretty much everything open at the 80% mark with rules and with some limits, but open. Uh, all of those milestones, they're all dependent on people going and getting vaccinated. They're all dependent upon people taking up those appointments I spoke about before, thousands of them. That's just in state hubs. Beyond our state hubs, we know, because Anthony Tassani was here from the Pharmacy Guild very recently, telling you and through you all Victorians the fact that the, uh, the rollout of the, uh, the Moderna vaccine in community pharmacy, there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of spots. Uh, so please go to your pharmacist, please go to your GP, uh, or please go online and book one of those state hub spots. There literally are thousands and thousands of uh, appointments available. And if you take one of those, you play your part, then you'll contribute to not only these numbers and it's hitting key markers and thresholds in the delivery of the national plan, you'll also protect yourself and the people that you love the most. Uh, we're not seeing people who are double vaccinated finishing up gravely, gravely ill or if in hospital. If we are, it's a tiny number. It's a tiny number. What is more uh, reasonable, what is more likely to assume and what the numbers support is that if you're double vaccinated, you're at lower risk of getting it if you do happen to get it, you're at a dramatically lower risk of becoming unwell. Uh, and the more people that are in that position, vaccinated, that's less people in ICU, that's less people in hospital, that's, uh, that's less work for our nurses. So for every reason, every reason, personal and otherwise, please go and book one of those appointments, whether it be AstraZeneca or Moderna at a pharmacy, uh, AstraZeneca or Pfizer at a state hub, or AstraZeneca or Pfizer at your local GP. There are, there's no reason to not do this. It makes sense and it's what makes, it's what will get us free. It's what will get us back to normality. That's why it's so important. I'm now gonna ask Martin to speak to some vaccinated economy trials. You remember that we've talked a lot about the fact that certain parts of the economy will be open for those who are double vaxxed. Uh, and at this time, because it's simply too risky from a transmission point of view to have it as a mixed environment, if you like, so people who are not protected by the vaccine, mixing and mingling and sharing spaces with those who are. Uh, we did say that we would trial this, the technology and how, it, how it's going to work. And so as promised, uh, we are delivering those trials and Martin's here to talk a little bit more in detail about those. Over to you, Minister. Thanks, Premier. Um, so uh, as the Premier indicated today, we're announcing um, a plan. Over to you, Minister. 
Thanks, Premier. Um, so, uh, as the Premier indicated, today we're announcing um, a plan for a series of vaccinated economy trials uh, in regional Victoria uh, as we get closer to the thresholds for opening up. Um, those trials are scheduled to start from the 11th of October. Uh, that's roughly a fortnight before we anticipate reaching uh, the 70% double dose threshold, which at the moment we're uh, expecting to occur on about the 26th of October. Um, it's about seeing how our vaccinated economy system uh, might work, and we'll trial that with higher patron numbers um, and crowds with everyone on site being confirmed as fully vaccinated. So what it will mean in effect uh, is that for those venues, events, uh, and, and locations which we nominate as trial sites, um, they'll be able to operate at that 70% threshold number. Um, so whatever the what, whatever the, uh, the, the the details are at 70%, they'll be able to do that a little bit earlier um, as part of those trials. So it will tell us how um, uh, the vaccinated economy system works for businesses, how it works for individuals, how it works for community organisations. So. We're going to be uh, nominating up to 20 trial sites throughout regional Victoria. We'll be doing them in LGAs with low case numbers and high vaccination rates. So the Chief Health Officer has, in the initial sense, nominated six LGAs um, where these trials can occur. Um, they are uh, Buloke, Pyrenees, Bass Coast, Greater Bendigo, East Gippsland and Warrnambool. Uh, if you look at um, a couple of those as examples, in Bulite, which is around uh, Witchy Proof, um, they have a double dose rate of 63% and a single dose rate of 88%, so very high vaccination numbers in Buloke. And in Pyrenees, which is around Beaufort and Avoca, um, they have a 64% double dose rate and a 90% single dose rate. So extremely high vaccination rates in those municipalities, and it marks them out as being perfect for these trials to be run. So in terms of the the sort of settings and the uh, industries where we think those trials might work. Hospitality, obviously, um, hair and beauty, uh, tourism, um, some types of events, so potentially country race meetings, uh, concerts, community gatherings, um, all of those types of events will be able to be considered uh, for trials of the double vax economy. Um, we'll be looking at um, how we can best establish someone's uh, vaccination status uh, as part of these trials, so um, how the Commonwealth Vax data can best be integrated with the Service Victoria app. Um, we'll be looking at other proof of vaccination options as well, um, Medicare on online, the Express Plus Medicare app, um, hard copies of vaccination certificates that can be obtained through Services Australia, all of those, uh, all of those different types of proof uh, will be considered as part of the trials. We'll also be looking at what sort of training staff need, um, what sort of support business owners require, uh, what sort of public communication of vaccine requirements will be necessary. So all of that will be fed into these trials and we'll have support officers on the ground uh, to help ensure that those trials run smoothly. Um, for businesses or events that want to participate in the trials, we are encouraging you to get in touch with your peak body. So, you know, if you're a pub, you might want to contact the AHA. If you're a restaurant, the Restaurant and Caterers Association, um, the Hair and Beauty Industry Association, etc. Um, we'll be um, talking to those peak bodies to help us uh, select. Uh, the the venues that will participate in the trials. This is a really important step uh, on the path to us becoming a, a, an open vaccinated economy. Um, we need these trials to ensure um, that we understand all of the potential issues that might arise, but we, moreover, um, we need people to get vaccinated so that they can, once we get to 70 and 80, uh, attend these venues, uh, attend these events, attend these concerts safely and ensure that they don't catch the virus or pass the virus on to others. So these trials are a really important step along the way. Uh, they will be starting pretty soon. and. Um, uh, I'd encourage anyone uh, who wants to be part of the trials in those six municipalities 
um, to get in touch with their peak body. I should also make the point, and it's, uh, it's set out in the media release, that once we get past 70, we'll be looking at a, a range of other settings and other locations um, so that we can then test the 80% the settings in between 70 and 80. Uh, and that may well be trials run in metropolitan Melbourne. It may well be trials in larger, more significant events. Uh, and we'll have more to say about that once we've done this first phase of trials. Uh, now, I'm now handing over to Deb uh, and uh, uh, then Jerome, I think, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Minister. Good morning. Um, so yesterday we were able to advise that the Surf Coast LGA would exit lockdown at 11.59 p.m. tonight. And I'm pleased to be able to say today that we're going to be able to give the same news to the city of Greater Geelong. Um, while there are still cases there and perhaps in another environment and in previous times, we would have stayed in lockdown to drive those numbers down to a hard zero. But that's no longer in line with our management of this virus under the national plan. Today we are reporting six cases that were in Geelong yesterday and one, one case in Surf Coast. Um, we take into account many factors. We take into account the fact that many of these cases are linked to known other cases, the lack of any major exposure sites within the areas and how well they can be managed by the local public health unit. We also look at high testing rates, vaccination rates, and also any changes to policy that can limit further growth in the short term. And this includes things like no travel between Melbourne and regional Victoria for construction. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to give the same news to the people of Mitchell Shire. Mitchell Shire being directly adjacent to some of the local government areas that have the highest rates of COVID anywhere in Australia is perennially vulnerable to these incursions from the, from the suburbs that they are right adjacent to. And that's what we're seeing regularly, pretty much on a daily basis. So unfortunately, we're not yet in a position to release lockdown in Mitchell Shire. And if you live there, you can help your community by getting tested, getting vaccinated, staying home and staying safe. I wanted to touch on vaccinations, um, specifically on the sad death of two individuals today who had COVID-19. What's notable, their ages in their 70s and in their 80s, and these people had been eligible for vaccination from the first day of our vaccine rollout in Victoria. However, the two individuals who passed away were not vaccinated. That's not to make any sort of statement. It's just a plea from me as a public health official, as a physician, but also as a human being and a daughter. Uh, please get vaccinated. If your elderly parents are yet to get the vaccine, please recognise that they're especially vulnerable. Please encourage them because two doses of this safe, effective and free vaccine can save their life. And finally, from me today, I want to recognise the hospital workers, the nurses and doctors, allied health staff, ancillary staff, who rise to the challenge of the increasing patients that we're seeing in hospital, to the administrators that create more bed capacity where there was none before with increasing hospitalisation rates, to the public health units who work tirelessly to trace and contain this outbreak all over our state, and the teams that monitor our COVID patients in the community and provide for their welfare on a daily basis. Thank you. Your work is very important and it's critical to every Victorian. I'll now hand over to Jerome. Thanks, Devin. Good morning. Uh, 779 uh, new cases of COVID in the last 24 hours. That takes us to uh, 8,011 active cases of COVID in Victoria at this point in time. Um, our outbreak map is very similar to what we've seen over the last four weeks. Um, over half of our cases um, are in the northern suburbs, 417 cases in the northern suburbs, including suburbs such as Craigieburn, Meadow Heights and Rockford Park. In the western suburbs, we've seen 216 cases, just over a quarter of today's total, in Altona North, Point Cook, and St Albans. In our southeastern suburbs, we have 93 cases, just over 10% of today's total, in Pakenham, Dandenong, and Cranbourne East. 
in our eastern suburbs, we have 31 cases, particularly in Templestowe. And in Regional Vic, there are 20 cases overnight. And I'll just spend a bit more time on, on the regional picture, especially given the news um, that Deb's just given. So of the 20 cases in Regional Victoria, uh, we have six in Geelong, all linked and, and connected and understood. We have five cases in Mitchellshire, uh, two in Ballarat, two in Shepparton, and a single case in Bendigo and a few other isolated cases here and there. Um, all those regional cases, with the exception of uh, a bit more work to do in Mitchellshire, are all reasonably well linked and understood, primary primary close contacts of existing cases. Uh, there are two cases we're still investigating in today's total numbers. Um, with regard to regional Victoria, I want to do a particular shout out to regional businesses, particularly as we take Geelong and Surf Coast out of those lockdown restrictions. Um, Firstly, I want to thank all regional businesses for the really hard work they're doing to keep their work premises as COVID safe as they possibly can for their staff and for their customers. Um, we've actually seen a really good record over the last few weeks of particularly some very high risk workplaces. If I look at our aged care facilities, uh, some of our really uh, difficult cold, cold and meat processing facilities, avoiding having any COVID outbreaks in those settings. The surveillance work you're doing, the PPE arrangements you've got, all those COVID safe practices are really important in avoiding getting that transmission within your workplaces. Uh, in fact, in the last couple of days, we've seen a number of surveillance testing figures pull up some, some indications of concern, which on subsequent testing, we've managed to remove from our investigations. It's a really important part of really important control in some of our most delicate settings. So thank you for everybody who's working so hard to keep COVID out of your workplaces. Um, we have those seen, if I look at the, the cases over the last week or so, um, I'd ask all regional uh, businesses who are running office facilities and headquarters facilities where metro staff or metro employee or staff who live in the metro areas are still coming into your workplace. Do they really need to be there? Is it really important that those staff are traveling every day or every now and then from metro into those regional centers? We've seen significant outbreaks in Geelong at head office operations. We've seen similar outbreaks elsewhere. I'd ask for business to be particularly careful about training facilities. We've seen trainers from Metro Melbourne move into some regional centres to provide training and in doing so uh, un unknowingly transmit COVID or at least create exposure sites for COVID. Again, be very mindful about those specialist trades and individuals that you, need, you think you need to move in from, regional, uh, from metro areas to regional areas. And finally, as always, um, staff gatherings. Uh, we have a case um, where there are 10, now 10 staff cases in one workplace associated with a workplace gathering uh, involving a bit of food sharing. Um, all, as usual, for understandable reasons, completely in contravention to the normal COVID safe principles. So food sharings, parties, gatherings are just not the thing we can afford to do at the moment, and not when in a workplace of 14 people, 10 walk away from that gathering um, being positive with COVID. So please, um, keep an eye on your COVID safe plans, understand where your staff are coming from, and make sure that if you have got staff coming in from metro areas, that they're undertaking those full COVID safe protocols every single time. Um, in terms of testing, testing remains, of course, a really important part of how we uh, stay on top of these outbreaks and understand and support those who are living with COVID. We've seen a really good response in Geelong, um, 3,773 tests yesterday. Uh, that's been doubling in the last week. Um, fantastic response, which has enabled us to get our arms around those positive cases and to make sure we're not seeing uh, any further signs of community transmission at this point. Um, we have more work to do in Mitchellshire, 450 tests yesterday. Um, those numbers have been fairly flat over the last week. And again, I'd encourage people in Kilmore, uh, Wallan, Beveridge and other locations to really come forward and get tested. Um, if you've had any concern about exposures to those listed exposure sites or contact with people who we know to be positive. Um, in the metro areas, we've seen a great response in Hume. Uh, over 4,000 tests today, yesterday, and over most of the last week. Um, we're testing about 60% more people in Hume than any other part of um, Metro Melbourne at the moment. Great to see people coming out. It is, of course, helping us to, to get a better understanding of where we're seeing that transmission. And the majority of that transmission continues to be within the home and between households. And again, I say, um, by all means, focus on those exposure sites that we list every day, but recognize that one of the most important, probably the most, uh, the largest single exposure site is the home. It's your home in terms of transmission within the home. It is certainly going to other people's households. That's what we're seeing the vast majority of people picking up COVID uh, when we'd rather they avoided that. 
Um, finally, in Dandenong, we're seeing around 850 tests today. Again, I'm concerned in the southeastern suburbs with the number of cases coming through day by day. Um, again, 93 cases yesterday. Uh, we'd like to see stronger levels of testing, more people coming forward to get tested in those southeastern suburbs. More testing facilities have been set up and will continue to be set up to enable people to do so. Um, in terms of vaccination, just to add to the Premier's comments, um, not only are there 10,000 first dose bookings available in the state clinics uh, in the next seven days, um, the, the number of vaccine, uh, vaccines being made available to pharmacists and GPs are increasing steeply. In the next week or so, there'll be 600,000 doses a week going to GPs and pharmacists across Victoria. Um, that's a fantastic opportunity for people to really start ramping up um, not only their first dose vaccination, but also to get their second doses done. Um, so please, there are now 1,114 GPs across the state administering Pfizer and AstraZeneca. So you can also get your Pfizer appointments there. And there are 444, 440 pharmacies already um, uh, uh, allocating Moderna. There'll be an additional 280 pharmacists getting Moderna next week. Part of that big step up in the availability of both Pfizer and Moderna over the weeks ahead. So if you've been, uh, if you've not been able yet to make an appointment, if you've uh, found yourself bounced back by your, by your, uh, by your other sources, look at your pharmacist on every retail strip. They've now got their signs out on the street saying we're doing Moderna vaccines here. Um, talk to your GP to see if they've got slots for you, or of course come on to our state clinics. We really want to start accelerate this rate of vaccination as we're now in, a, in the next week or so starting to see significant uh, allocations being made available to our GPs and to our pharmacists. Um, Finally, in terms of um, our ongoing work to, uh, to deal with any, any risk of interstate travel, interstate incursions, um, in the last week, 631 people um, arrived from red zones uh, into, uh, into our airports, particularly into Melbourne Airport. Um, 15 of those were sent back for not having the appropriate documentation or the right materials. 23 were, um, were moved into hotel quarantine and 161 were returning Victorians traveling on the appropriate paperwork to enable them to do their home isolation uh, and to finally get back. And we're very grateful to see them back. And of course, we'll continue to support returning Victorians over the days and weeks ahead. Um, with that, I'll hand to the Premier for questions. I might just pick up on Jerome's point in relation to vaccinations as well. We had said we'd do 25%. We've in fact done 50%. Uh, we're gonna keep doing the same numbers. We might even increase them. But as a percentage of the overall effort, I hope that percentage comes down. I hope more and more people are going to their pharmacy, more and more people are going to their GP, so that we can see that part of the system increase its share, uh, and ours might even come down a bit. But ultimately, there is supply available in all three places, pharmacy, GP, state clinics. Uh, please make one of those appointments. There are lots of those appointments available, and that's how we will be first dose, second dose, and then we will be free. We will be beyond this, uh, and that is very, very important. All of us are happy to take any questions you have. Premier, this might be one for you or Minister Pakula, but with the vaccinated economy trials, how do you foresee that being policed? Is that going to fall to junior staff, wait staff, for example, to be checking IDs, checking vaccination passports? Well, no, I wouldn't think it was junior staff. I would think it would need to be taken seriously, and people will be trained, as the Minister has indicated, there'll be a training element to this. Uh, this is critically important. If we want these venues to be open, if we want them to have capacities that are higher than would otherwise be the case, if you were not insisting on only vaccinated people, then the total number of people at the different milestones in the roadmap, the numbers allowed would be much lower. So it's in everybody's interest, particularly the business, to take this seriously. But I think it's important to acknowledge at this point that the overwhelming majority of businesses across the whole state have taken their COVID safe responsibilities very, very seriously. There'll always be some who don't. But these trials are about proving up uh, and, and in real terms, seeing where some of these issues might be. If we were completely certain that it would all be totally smooth, then we wouldn't do the trials. I think the trials are going to inform us. But uh, COVID safety is not something for the most junior member of staff. They need to be concerned about it. Every member of staff need to be concerned about it. But I think a suitably qualified person who's been trained and who knows and understands how the system works, that's who's going to be doing that. Plus there'll be authorised officers, plus there'll be uh, Victoria Police, if that's necessary. I, I think people will do their, their level best to follow these guidelines, to follow these rules, because they know that that's why the place is open. And that's why it's open with you know, 50 or 100 people in it, rather than closed or open with a very small number of people. 
So for every good reason, people will, I think, take these rules seriously. Sure, but is there a safeguarding going on? We've seen a lot of vaccine hostility, people coming out, they, you know, directing that at staff. Is there safeguarding going on ahead of the trials to make sure that businesses and yeah, their yeah. employees well, are protected? Yeah, sure. Part of, that, part of that expression of interest process is that we'll choose venues that we think are suitable for that trial. I would, I would not... Uh, I would hope that people behave appropriately and recognise that the the staff member who refuses to take your booking or refuses to allow you in because you are not vaccinated, they're simply following the rules. They're working on behalf of all of us. So there's always a there's always, I suppose, the possibility of people becoming uh, you know uh, aggressive or whatever it might be, you know, not being particularly pleased about the, the rules that are in place. I would encourage people to behave appropriately, and we'll be there to support venues, large and small, in the trials and indeed uh, beyond them. So in terms of fraud for the hospitality sector? Well, that decision has not been made yet. Uh, and again, I think we've had this discussion a few times about a proper process that needs to be gone through. The Chief Health Officer has to do that for, in order for it to be lawful. Uh, but I would just say, I think it would be, it would be strange if uh, you weren't allowed to stand at the public bar to have a beer, but the person who was pouring the beer, unless you were vaccinated, but the person pouring the beer didn't have to be vaccinated. So I think that might be where we get to, but it's not, that's not a matter for me. It's a matter for the Chief Health Officer and he is looking at all sorts of different sectors. But look, you just think about it. If you've got a busy place where you've got lots of customers coming in and out, you've got lots of staff, uh, you people are not people are staying for some sometimes a short period of time, sometimes a longer period of time, it just makes sense to have as many people vaccinated as possible. Hopefully everybody in that environment would have had two two jabs because the risk of people spreading it in those environments is obviously much, much higher. Can you can you talk? Oh, you can absolutely hear from so Minister Pakula uh, he can, for like he can an hour if you want. Well. Fine. Just in terms of fraud, and obviously Chief's, uh, Chief Health Officer yes. Brett Sons mentioned it a couple of times. I understand why we need uh, a hard copy for older Victorians who may not use smartphones yep. or whatever else. Yep. But you mentioned Medicare's app rather than the COVID Safe Victoria. Um, oh, sorry, rather than um, the check-in system that we currently have being trialled as well. Is that going to be verifiable? How will these no, businesses as I, actually verify? So, so as, as, as I understand it, there'll be, there's a few different, it's, it's, not about, uh, it's not about the front end, it's about how you link up data behind the scenes, if you like, to give you the green tick or, or the red cross. Right? So uh, you've got the uh, Australian Immunisation Registry, uh, you've got Medicare data, you've got all sorts of different places where the, these, the, these stories live, right? The key point here is there is a four-digit number. We've just got to link that with the Services Victoria app. Uh, so it's linking an application with a database, something that's static with something that's dynamic. So it's not quite as simple as it seems. But uh, Danny Pearson and others have been working on, on all of that uh, New South, with, with New South Wales also. Uh, so I think, I think what Martin's saying, and he can, he can answer any other questions you have, I think it's, it's just not quite settled. But we're very confident that we'll be able to link the two things together. And then as you check in, as you QR in, that will also serve to determine whether you have been vaccinated or not. Now you're right, Mark, to say there will be some people who don't have a smartphone and they'll have they'll do it the old fashioned way with a piece of piece of paper. There'll also be, just for the avoidance of doubt, if you cannot be vaccinated for virtue of by, by virtue of health reasons, for instance, then you would have the same status as someone who is green, because it's not you haven't chosen not to be, you can't be. But again, I think many of those people would be taking advice from their doctor about whether they should be in some of these sort of environments, given that they can't be protected. Do you want to, you, you, I'm happy for Martin to add to it. Yeah, be sure. Um, just because um, I suppose the main question is, will the linkage between the Services Victoria app and the, the database be ready in time for this trial? Because otherwise you did mention the Medicare status, which yeah. anyone can on their phone. So, so we hope so, but we're not entirely sure. So we are confident that the Service Victoria app, and Minister Pearson is doing this work, uh, he's leading this work on behalf of the government. We're confident that the Service Victoria app will have access to the vaccination data by 11 October, but, it, but, but we're saying um, it's certainly within October. Um, but we've also said that that not being necessarily available on the Service Vic app won't delay this trial. So right now, if you've got a smartphone, you can show your vaccination status in your Apple wallet or you, you know your other digital wallet. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, we're saying get in touch with Services Australia and get a hard copy of the certificate. Um, and we're hopeful 
that Services Victoria will have that interaction with the Commonwealth Vaccination Registration or Register by October 11, but if it's a few days later, um, we'll proceed with this trial, notwithstanding that. Both Medicare vaccination certificates essentially, both um, online and in hard copy, can be easily manipulated. Will there be any provisions in place to ensure, I guess, um, to check the authenticity of particularly hard copy vac certificates? Well, well look, I'm not... I'm not. I'm not a technical expert on on the the um, on the security of the Medicare system. I understand that the Commonwealth is working um, very quickly to try and uh, protect that system from um, from fraud. I have seen the reports which say that there is some um, uh, some ability for a smart hacker to try and um, alter the, that digital record, and I, and I understand that the Commonwealth is working to protect it from that. Um, but that's really part of what the trial is about. The, the trial is partly about um, ensuring that we understand all of those different pressure points and all of those different possibilities um, so that by the time we get to 70 and 80 per cent, we've got a much better idea of what's secure and what's not. So I think, look, I think the IT that sits behind this is getting better all the time. Um, I know that in other parts of the world this has been done in a way that's, you know, that's protective of, of, of attempts to defraud. Uh, I'm quite certain that the Commonwealth will get there um, here as well. Uh, but you know, we can't let the availability of the IT solution um, delay us unduly because 70 and 80 per cent is coming upon us quite soon. Uh, and we need to run these trials to make sure that we've got, you know, all of the answers to questions like that. Is there a possibility that we get to 70 per cent double dosed and it's not in place in terms of a verifiable way via Services Victoria? Oh, well, it would be it would be heroic for anyone to give um, absolute watertight commitments about the availability of IT solutions but we are we, we are very we, we are working very closely with the Commonwealth Services Victoria are um, doing all the work and we think that certainly sometime in October that Services Victoria app will be able you know there'll be a scannable ability um, to show your vaccination status Sorry, I suppose the better question would be if it's not ready in time will that in any way or shape or form impact the number of people allowed in venues if there's not a verifiable way of, of doing that through services Victoria? Uh, no look the, the, the roadmap the roadmap um, has um, you know various things that people will be allowed to do at various numbers when we reach those numbers that's our expectation that's what people will be able to do uh, and we've got you know we'll have um, as much IT support for that as we possibly can um, and we'll make sure that businesses um, are, are very clear about what their obligations and their rights are and what support they can expect when we get the, to those numbers. Sorry, Simone. Sally Capp is very vocal about trying to get this kind of trial here in the CBD to try and reboost, yep. I suppose, the economy here. Is there a chance that you could see the CBD used in this trial at all? Well, look, as I indicated in my initial comments, the, the, the six LGAs that have been chosen uh, are based on VAC status and, and cases, but they, they will be those that we um, initially use between October 11 and when we get to 70%. So that's a, a two, two and a half week period, hopefully, you know, provided people keep getting vaccinated. Um, what we've also indicated is that from 70 to 80%, we want to trial um, in a range of other settings and in a range of other localities using the 80 percent, um, the 80 percent numbers. So, you know, for example, at 80 percent, um, the roadmap says that you might be able to have events with up to 5,000 people. So we might have some, um, you know, things closer to Metro Melbourne, whether in, the, in whether in the city of Melbourne or in the suburbs of Melbourne, um, where we can trial those numbers. Um, in real life scenarios um, in, in a different set of LGAs, but we'll have to have those conversations with public health about where it would be appropriate to do that. Could that be something like the Melbourne Cup? Oh, conceivably, yeah, conceivably. Look, we would hope um, that, uh, and, and as the Premier indicated um, a week or so ago, that we'll be at 80% by Cup Day. That's certainly what we're striving for. Um, now, it's going to be touch and go, but yes, conceivably, that, that's the sort of thing that uh, we, we could potentially run a trial at if we're not quite there. Given that we would like to be there by Cup Day, and maybe it's one for the Premier in terms of National Cabinet and vaccine supply, but 
are you actively considering cutting down the weight for Pfizer vaccines from six weeks back to three weeks, given that, as you indicated, we've seemingly got some decent supply? I don't think I'm the one to answer that. I'd certainly try, Mark. Uh, just further to Minister Pakula's uh, point, very well made point, uh, of course you can't do trials in Melbourne while Melbourne's locked down. So as soon as we're up out of lockdown at 70, then we've got all sorts of options and we can, there'll be, there'll be lots of stuff happening in, happening in Melbourne. Uh, in terms of the interval between first and second doses for Pfizer, as I've said to you a few times now, they're not political decisions. They've got to be made on advice. Uh, th that was not when I think I was up last Thursday, I think when I spoke last Thursday, uh, that was not an option because we simply didn't have enough certainty about what was coming to us in the third week of October. I think we still need a little bit more certainty about what's happening. I think we've got three weeks of certainty. We need four weeks. Otherwise, you can get yourself into a really difficult position. If you start taking what are currently second doses that are waiting there for people to come along when they're due, if you start taking those for first doses, for instance, or if you change the balance, uh, or if you, 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 you do more second doses than you had planned is probably the better way to put it, more second doses than you had originally planned, and that stock is not replaced, then you're gonna run out of second dose vials. So as we get more certainty of Pfizer supply, and pleasingly we've had some of that, but as we get more of that, then it becomes a real option for us to potentially bring forward, uh, whether it's from six to four to three, uh, and that would mean that we were getting more people into that double vaxxed 70% number faster, but it's all about how much is in the fridge. It's got better since I last spoke to you, but I don't think we're ready, or sorry, I don't think we're able to be able to make that decision today, but hopefully we can make that decision soon. So what is the balance of first versus second doses you're expecting to do throughout October, given that we're gonna to get to 80% in two days time? Oh, I might, Jerome might be able to give you a more detailed understanding of that, but the key point is just to go back, if someone's sitting at home watching thinking, well, why can't we just speed this up and get there faster? Uh, we may be able to, but at the moment we don't have either stock on hand or committed guaranteed stock arriving over the next three or four weeks for us to be able to change the six weeks down to something less. If that, if we get more stock or certainty about what's coming to us, then that absolutely can be an option. And we would definitely look at that because it would, it, it would, it would mean that we would get, we would get to our double dose targets faster. You just got to have the stuff. You can't get it into people's arms if you haven't got it. That um, Pfizer has assured we'll Australia it will receive nine million doses of COVID vaccine no, um, next month. Those supply issues had been, I guess, resolved, and he said that those updated figures would be provided to state and territory governments. Has he provided you with those updated figures? I think we have some greater certainty, even just in the last few days, than we had Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday last week when Jerome and I spoke. Not through a sense of criticism, just to. I think we were asked the question, can you shorten the interval? And the answer was no, I don't have enough stuff. Um, that's getting better. Uh, the other thing too, though, is that Pfizer's supplying Australia. The key point there is he's not just supplying state hubs, they're supplying us, they're supplying uh, G GPs as well. And that means that the whole system is there for people to use. Uh, but from our point of view, uh, we're not quite at a point yet where we can make, make that change. Hopefully that becomes an option to us really soon. Uh, and if we can, anything we can do to get more jabs in more arms or to get us to these thresholds quicker, absolutely we will. That's why we've, I don't think we ever thought we'd have 55 state hubs and pop-ups everywhere. And we're certainly doing more than we thought. And it's working. It's it's absolutely working as these numbers tick up. So we look at um, possibly manufacturing Moderna here then as one way to try and get more um no, we've got we've got sufficient supplies. There's sufficient supplies of uh, Moderna. I'll have a bit more to say about Moderna and some some uh, some things we're doing in that space quite soon. But Moderna is principally community pharmacy. They've got literally hundreds of thousands of uh, doses. Uh, they're, they're they're geared right up. This has only been about a week since they since they started, but uh, all the reports I get is that they're working really well. So you can go and make an appointment at your pharmacy uh, for AstraZeneca or the Moderna vaccine. Our state hubs for AstraZeneca or Pfizer. There's no Moderna in our state hubs at this point. Uh, and then GPs have got AstraZeneca and uh, Pfizer. That's 
or trials, I guess even home quarantine, etc., they all rely on the state of emergency powers that's due to expire at the end of the year. I know you're in the process of drafting bills. What stage is that at and when will you release those draft bills? Uh, you're right to say that we're still doing that work. It's not concluded yet. Cabinet's not finished its deliberations on those matters. And, uh, as always, we'll have those out there in uh, plenty of time and that, that process of negotiation and discussion with the crossbench and others will uh, continue. When do you think that might be able to happen? Because I think it's expiring mid-December, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't give there. you a date tomorrow on exactly when we'll have a bill in the parliament, but obviously I, I don't have a um, photographic recall of when the sitting dates are, but we'll get it, we'll, we, we have to get it done by the date you've nominated and we'll uh, achieve that. Otherwise, all the rules don't have a legal underpinning. The rules that'll be by that stage, you know, we're very much about being open and staying open. So yes, we will, we will need to continue those legislative arrangements. There are reports on Jet Shed potentially being a makeshift hospital. Is, is the system yeah, that, that under strain that something no, like I, that needs to happen? Uh, the, the, there were some reports about this being something that's like going to happen next week. That's, that's not, that's not uh, accurate. That's not even, I think, a live plan. There was discussions last year about whether you, because again, we didn't know, we had no vaccine and we didn't know how bad things were going to get. So there were all sorts of different things done last year around field hospitals and things of that nature. We're doing everything we can to try and avoid having to get to that. Now there's a lot of talk about the 4,000 ICU beds. If we need to flex up to that, we will. But no one should, like, I don't think you want the government to be essentially recruiting people into ICU beds, like as if that's some sort of a, some sort of a desired outcome. Like we'll open beds as we need them. We will change the way the hospital system works as we need to, to make sure that the sickest patients always get treated quickest. Uh, but no, I don't think it's going to come to to that. Uh, and we're certainly working as hard as we can so that we don't need to be doing field hospital options. Uh, but again, uh, money is not an option. The money is not an op not a problem or an um, obstacle, I should, I should say. Money is not an obstacle. Uh, 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 consumables and equipment is not an obstacle. Uh, the biggest barrier at the moment is how do we source the types and the numbers of people that we need, given how fatigued people are. Like our health staff have done such an amazing job over this, well, it's 20 months, 21 months. You know, there is a sense of fatigue there. It's also very, very challenging work. If it's, well, all health work is challenging, but these patients are it's very, very difficult work. So they're not, and plus, not everybody is a critically care trained nurse. They don't. You don't produce one in five minutes either. Like these are highly, highly skilled people. So there's always limits on that. Uh, but there'll be, so it's not about funding, it's not about equipment, it's not about consumables and PPE and all that sort of stuff. There's enough of that. That's the advice I have, there's enough of all that. Uh, it's more about staff and trying to manage fatigue. And the other thing too is that you don't open ICU beds and have them sit empty. Like you open them when you have patients to put in them. But no one should be barracking for uh, for a thousand people in ICU, or let alone four thousand, like that's that. If we get to that point, and we may, that is uh, very, very challenging. Very challenging. When you say you could flex up to four thousand beds if you needed to, do, well, we'll, you, have we'll the, do you have the staff to do that? Oh well, again, as I've said, and I've been at pains to make this point. Yeah, you know, whether it's two thousand, one thousand, fifteen hundred, whatever the number is, right? You start to get to those sorts of numbers. You can't flex up to that and maintain that for weeks and months. Like that's incredibly difficult because the staff you've got, well, there's only so many double shifts people can work. So, and we've and we've recruited more staff and we'll move people around and we'll try and, you know, balance things differently and all of that. And our staff will work with us, I know they will, but there are limits. There are limits. And as we've seen in so many parts of the world, you know, you can get to a, a, to, a to an unrecognisable peak, like get to a place that you never thought you were ever going to need to get to, but you can't stay there for very long because your staff just, you know. But Given those limits, should you have promised those 4,000 last year? No, well, what we did was is we went and bought as many machines as we could. We went and bought as much PPE, as much equipment as we could, and that was what we could have done for a period if we'd needed to last year. A couple of, couple of points. One, we had no vaccine last year. We were, no one knew. No one knew, and it was best that a whole lot of ventilators were in our warehouse rather than in somebody else's warehouse. Uh, it's also very different. We're, we're a full year on now, and the notion of sort of fresh legs and, and these whole fatigue issues, they're very real. They're very real. There's been no easy days in the health system in the intervening period, Rachel, is the point I'm making. And the other thing too is this is Delta. It's not last year's COVID. It's very, very different. 
both in terms of the, the speed with which it moves, the seriousness of illness with which it, uh, that, that, you, that, that, that our nurses have to, have to treat. So it's not only more infectious, but people are getting sicker when they have this. Uh, and again, passage of time. You know, just the, there's only so long you can keep this going. And it's a bit like, I don't know how many times we've sat here and talked about uh, all sorts of fatigue in the Victorian community, you know, people visiting, people not following the rules, all that sort of stuff. The fact that we're all tired and want this to be over, well, our nurses are tired too. So what we, what we planned for last year and what we hurriedly went and bought up uh, is not necessarily relevant this year because it's a different virus. We're 12 months on. And again, I just say, uh, those sorts of capacity issues and 4,000 versus 1,000, that's not stopping us from opening up. The thing that's stopping us from opening up right now is that we haven't got 70% double dose and 80% double dose, but we will very soon. Just on another issue, do you back the PM's visit? Jerome's waiting here just quietly. He's, he's, been on, he's, on, he's on the balls of his feet to got questions for answer him, a true. question that he's, we've all forgotten what it was. Sorry, do I back do the PM back the on PM's what? Do you back the view that state borders should reopen once vaccination rates reach 80%? I certainly hope, hope so. I certainly hope so. But again, I, with the greatest respect to the PM, that's not his, that's not his call. That's a call for chief health officers and for premiers. And the national plan, which we are faithfully delivering, uh, doesn't really go to these issues. Doesn't really go to these issues. No one's locked into having borders open. I want them to be open. I want people to be able to travel across their state, interstate, travel overseas if they think that's something that they want to do. But again, I can't, I can't predict that uh, beyond that, you know, what I would hope. We have to wait and see how things, how things go and how many cases there are. Okay. Just like I don't think the Prime Minister would necessarily be able to give you a definitive list of all the countries that are going to be able to in, be in uh, travel bubbles with us right now. You'll have to wait and see. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been rightfully focused on Melbourne's northern and western suburbs where cases have been high. We've yes. been flexing up both testing and vaccination as yep. well. Um, as Jerome mentioned before, there is some concern in the southeastern suburbs. Again, it's a younger population, mobile workforce, um, fewer rates of GPs and pharmacists per head compared to more affluent areas. Before those areas get to what we're seeing in Melbourne's north, for example, is there a possibility to increase vaccination, testing, and just go really hard and be proactive about that's exactly it. That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, but when I say we, you know, we our our program is only a part of the overall program. So uh, I don't want I don't I don't want to sort of have an argument for its own sake with the Commonwealth or anybody. But like we have complete control about where testing sites go, for instance. So when we have a problem, we have more testing done in that area. We don't have complete control about where GPs are, about which GPs are actually uh, accredited, then where pharmacies are. That's not a matter for us. So I think we've always shown a propensity, a willingness, and we've in, in real terms, we have actually gone and targeted our efforts, but not every effort is ours and not everything can be controlled by us. But uh, just as Jerome called out the need to test, so will I, if you're in the southeastern suburbs and you've got any symptoms, it's especially important that you go and get tested and indeed anywhere across the whole state. If you've got symptoms, there's so little cold and flu around. If you've got symptoms, you've got COVID. That's what you've got to assume. Uh, so yes, Samaya, we will do more as much as we can to target those areas, just as we have been doing in the north and the west. So there'll be pop-up clinics, yeah. more state-run hubs, for example. And I know it's- Well, not you know, necessarily more state-run hubs. There's quite a few out there and they're very busy. They're very busy. I can. I haven't been to one myself, um, but uh, uh, Kath took Joe to one recently and was very busy, very, very busy. And just in hindsight, I guess, you know, we need to learn lessons from this pandemic, you know, in, in the probably very likely circumstance, we'll experience another pandemic in our lifetime. Do you think rolling out vaccines or having the GPs as the cornerstone of our vaccination rollout was the wrong decision, given how, given the inequitable distribution, I guess, of GPs around the country? Samaya, can I say to you that uh, I don't think it would be useful for me to speculate on that matter. I'm, we're, we're still asking. I don't think it's right for me to be running some commentary, and I may have all sorts of different views on those matters, but we're still asking. Like right now, we're asking a lot of our GPs, and I don't want to be in any way uh, detracting from the work that they're doing. Um, they're doing a great job. We're, we're proud of them. We're grateful to them. They've got a lot more jabs to do. So do we. So do community pharmacy. Uh, this is the system we have, and now we just gotta, we've just got to get people through this system and, and get our numbers up. And 
just on one final point on this, given we're most likely going to have booster shots and we know yes. the rates of GPs around the state, do you think the vaccination, how will we sort of start targeting or be able to distribute a lot more vaccines to, to those who are most at risk of contracting sure. and transmitting the virus? Well, the question will be, the, the, again, the question sort of hinges on the term we. So in terms of boosters, there's been no decisions made about how booster shots will be done. Uh, the priority order, what the distribution mechanism will be. I'm sure there's lots of advanced thinking about that, but I don't think it's settled yet. So I'm not sure what role we'll be playing, whether there'll be more state hubs still doing boosters, the same sort of tripartite thing with pharmacy, GP and us. Uh, you'd have to ask the federal government about that. But I know we, we are reassured at National Cabinet repeatedly that the orders have been placed, they've got them. If they haven't got them, they're coming. Like if that's all, that's all in hand, uh, then it's a matter of who needs a booster and when and how do you prioritise? There's a lot of work in that. But uh, if you're really asking me this, will in the booster program there be learnings from the original first and second dose rollout? Yeah, of course there will be. That's and people would expect us, all of us, to 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 use that massive exercise never been done before, really, uh, and to learn from that. Uh, just a quick question Last before question. we hand it over. Um, will students? Over it's all right. They can't, it's coming. It's all right. Your own, your own. Maybe set a little to go. bit premature. But will students over the age of twelve need to have had a, one dose of vaccine before they can return to school next year? And will year eleven and twelve students have to be fully vaccinated? No, I, I, I think I know what you're referring to. And um, you know, there are lots of staff around the place, and people will think about all sorts of different possibilities and options. And I can tell you, as the person who chairs the cabinet committees that make these decisions, I've never seen that piece of paper. It's of no standing. And the school's plan was announced by the Deputy Premier and Education Minister the other day. And those things were not a feature of it because they're not a feature of it. Just on that though, um, what is the government's sort of policy or advice for schools who might be dealing with large contingents of their community who are philosophically against vaccines? Well, they're there to serve their local community. If there's a philosophical objection, then they're probably not going to be able to change that. Uh, but that those schools will pose a greater risk to public health. We've already seen that. We've seen that with one school, one uh, community school, where I don't know what the case numbers are now. It was 60, 70 cases. You know, this is not good to get, whether you're five years old, 25 years old, 50 years old. It's not good to get if you've not been vaccinated. Now, a little as kids can't. Now, that may change next year. Who knows if there's a children's vaccine come forward. But, you know, we've all of us got to do everything we can to try and make sure that our schools are as safe as possible. So it's about uh, airflow monitoring, vent, uh, making sure there is a, the best ventilated space as possible, air filtration, compulsory vaccination for staff, all those things. Uh, I, I would expect our schools to be encouraging as much as they can, everybody that deals with them to have had two doses to be fully vaccinated, to be fully uh, protected, because by its very nature, particularly for primary schools, uh, the largest group of people in the primary school is not the staff, it's in fact the kids. And those kids cannot get vaccinated. There's no vaccine for them. So, you know, this is why we send these messages every day and we're out there speaking to groups large and small in every language, from every background, from every point of view. Please go and get vaccinated. That's how we get free, but it's also how we stay safe. Is just, there just any policy that. advice coming to schools though oh, from uh, the there's government? An, there's an enormous, an enormous amount of policy advice and work that's almost uh, continuous between the Department of Education. And the other thing to acknowledge uh, in your question, I think you probably do in the way you framed your question, is that it's, it, it, the, the school system is not just government schools, it's government schools, independent schools, Catholic schools. Uh, I'd encourage all, I'd encourage everybody 12 and up to go and get the first dose and then go and get the second dose, because it will mean you are at a vastly lower risk of finishing up in hospital. Is social quarantine at capacity? We're aware of a COVID member, a COVID case, sorry, who was going to try and get into hotel quarantine to protect her family, but was told that she couldn't get in because it was full. I'm not sure, happy to chase it up for you. I know that there's a lot of people, as, exactly as you described, so not internationals, but people who can't safely isolate that we've been looking after. But if you give me the specifics, I'm more than happy to follow that up. Just back on that anti-vaxxer philosophy, obviously we don't yes. have protests today, but have you heard any reports of GPs or others struggling with appointments being booked by people potentially of this group who are then just not turning up? I have seen a bit of reporting of that. I haven't had it directly briefed to me. I've seen some reports, but I'd encourage people. That's not the sort of behaviour we want to see. That's just not there. Yeah. 
you know, you might have a view, but don't stand in the way of other people expressing their view. Like, you know, you, you, you're pretending to take an appointment. That means that someone who wants to turn up and get vaccinated so that they can, you know, save their life and the life of others can't get an appointment. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. That's, that's the wrong thing. The wrong thing to do if, in fact, it is happening. I don't want to offend you, Ryan, but I do have a question for the Minister about the grand final, if that's... Very good. Can I just ask the Premier on the grand final, and this is a perfect segue into Minister Kapula. Should and will police be breaking up groups of long-suffering Demons fans gathering together, or will, you know, will police be cutting them? Well, some let me just say this. Police matters are matters for police, so you have to talk to them about what they're going to do in an sure. operational sense, and I'm not here that should, would, could, and all that. That's a matter for Victoria Police. Um, I, I, it was a great win by the Melbourne Football Club last, last night. And uh, on the point, though, of long-suffering, like, we're all long-suffering. So let's not any of us do anything that makes this pandemic event longer, makes this lockdown longer. There'll be a time to celebrate. We're all looking to the weeks ahead of Christmas and Christmas where all of this is behind us. So let's not any of us do anything right now, despite how you know, happy these fans would be. Let's not do that because it's against the, against the rules. Long suffering, relative, relative, relative term, relative term. One for the minister and then Jerome, there's a heavy line of questioning coming your way. Minister. And Minister, the consensus seems to be that Perth put on a pretty good show. What did you think of it? Did you watch? Yes, I watched. <laughs> um, it was a, look, it was a great grand final. Um, it was, uh, I think, halfway through the third quarter, you could not possibly have predicted what was coming. Uh, the dogs were, were playing really well, and the, and the, but the D's just overran them. Um, look, Optus Stadium looked fabulous. Um, uh, and uh, I'm sure all AFL fans thank the West Australian Government for providing a venue for the show to be put on and we're very much looking forward to having it back at the G next year. That's it. Don't want to share it around? Uh, absolutely not. No, no, we've got, I was, I was thinking someone might ask that. No, look, we've got a, a contract with the AFL to run the, the AFL Grand Final at the MCG until 2059 and that's what will happen. Um, now, uh, obviously, the last two years for, for uh, dedicated footy fans has been a bit painful. Um, although I think, you know, for Melbourne supporters, it probably the pain would have been a bit sated last night. But yeah, look, it's been it's been difficult to see the grand final played in other locations. We're looking forward to having it back, uh, and then having it back here for the next 37 years thereafter. You said never again last year. Are you confident that it's absolutely never again this time around? Well, last year, Rachel, um, no one was vaccinated. This year, um, you know, as of yesterday, about 47% of Victorians are double vaccinated. Next year, that won't be the case. Um, and yes, I'm absolutely confident. We've got, you know, look, we had a we, we had a really good start to the season. We had the Anzac Day game um, here with almost 80,000 people. Um, and until the un, until we had that incursion, um, it was all looking very positive. Unfortunately, the outbreaks happened at the wrong time of year for football. I don't expect that will happen again. Uh, this has become, right. become a bit of a memory exercise. Let me do the three. I'll do, I'll do three sets of questions in in, in one go. Uh, in terms of in terms of students and, and vaccinations, so we've seen a phenomenal uptake by twelve to fifteen year olds and, and sixteen and eighteen year olds of vaccine in the last few weeks given how relatively short the period has been. So 31% of 12 to 15 year olds already first dose vaccinated, 61, 62% of 16 to 30 year olds already first dose vaccinated. And those rates are going up really quickly every day. So I would say with the GAT coming up on the 5th of October, if you've got a you know, year 12, year 11 at home like I do, make sure they're vaccinated. You've still got a week to get their first dose in and there are appointments available in state clinics and there's point, there is appointments available in pharmacy and in GPs to get that done. And we're seeing that enthusiasm you know, the, 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 the kids are doing us proud, actually, in terms of how quickly they're getting on with the vaccination journey. So, Mayor, in terms of the um, the doses and, and particularly the Dandenong issues, so yesterday I went through at some length vaccination rates in different councils. Casey, 75 per cent from memory. Uh, Cardinia, 72 per cent. Dandenong, 70 per cent. And we've been talking over the last week or two around all those additional pop-ups we've had down there. So uh, Dandenong Market has um, done 7,000 or so doses over, over a fairly short period of time. Uh, we had Springville Town Hall um, that's been really busy down there. We had a, some colleges around near Warren. So we've done a lot of pop-ups in the southeast, as we have done in, in the Hume area and the north. And we'll continue to do that over the over the days ahead. 
In terms of dose allocations, again, I went through all those numbers yesterday uh, at some length. I think some of them were in the age this morning. Um, so we are seeing that really big step up of doses being made available to GPs and pharmacies, which is good news because it allows us to focus on the 200, 250, 300,000 that we're getting a, a week, about 250,000 a week on average in October. But the lion's share, you know, 600,000 doses in total going to GPs and pharmacies over that month of October. So we really want to see that being used to, to, to maximum effect. Um, and we will, you know, we'll, we'll be working very closely with them as we have been to ensure that system works for people. And then, Mark, in terms of the, the first, second dose allocation pieces, um, so we made a conscious decision, which we talked about at the at the end of August, which was to lengthen that gap on Pfizer from three to six weeks in, in state clinics, because we had so little vaccine available to us. So we lengthened that period out. That allowed us to hit at least you know over two hundred fifty thousand doses a week through state clinics, more than we were getting. But we managed to harvest all those that, that benefit of delaying the second doses. Those second dose appointments are all booked in our system and we, people who have got those second dose appointments will come and get them during the month of October. Over the last three or four weeks, we've been running around a three.